So uh, let me say good morning to those who are from Buryatia and to say good day or maybe good evening to our guests from the United States. And um, so I would like to welcome you to our event, which is becoming kind of a tradition. Uh, so we had it last year and uh, this year we also decided to have this literary salon, Christmas encounters, as I called it. Um, and uh, I would like to start with the introduction of everybody uh, very briefly, then we'll give the virtual floor to our speakers, uh, and then we'll listen to what the students have prepared today. Um, and we're going to work for about an hour and a half, so this is... Um, these are the regulations. So, and I would like to uh, introduce Carolyn Kramers, who has just been speaking. Uh, she's a literary, nonfiction, and poetry writer, and a teacher and a musician. She has received a number of literary prizes, like the Willer Award and uh, Andy Hope Literary Award, and others. And she's been a Fulbright Scholar in Buryatia, in Ulan Ude, actually twice. And uh, we hope to see her probably, probably uh, in the future here, because she's writing a book about Buryatia and she promised it will be finished soon. <laughs> so we hopefully will get to read it. Uh, so this is Carolyn. Um, then I would like to introduce to you Carol Davis. Um, who is also a Fulbright Scholar twice, and she was in St. Petersburg. And um, <clears throat> uh, in uh, and her first book actually was published in an English-Russian edition by Symposium in St. Petersburg. So, uh, and as far as I remember, Carol has some uh, connections. Uh, some Russian background, yeah, as far as I remember. Um, so she teaches at St. Monica College um, and um, in California, Los Angeles. And she also got a Fulbright Specialist Grant in 2020 again. And she's going to travel to Russia uh, as soon as it is possible. Um, and... Um, and Carol Davis received T.C. Eliot Prize for her poetry, and we're really glad to see her today here. So this is Carol and Monique. Um, Monique, are you there? Yep. Hello. Yeah, okay. Just having Zoom issues. All right. Okay. At least we can hear you. So we'll probably see you. Yes. Um, so, Monique, um, Monique Zamir, uh, she's from Texas, uh, but originally she's from New York. Um, and um, we met in Oklahoma State University when I was doing my Fulbright grant. So, Monique is not a Fulbright scholar, but anyway, she's connected with Fulbright. Um, and uh, She's a young, talented poet, and uh, she was uh, her poems were published in a number of American journals, uh, American poetry journals, and uh, she uh, is working on her first book of poems right now, and soon uh, it will be published. And she had an honorable mention from the Academy of American Poets Scholarship for one of her poems that she's going to read today. All right, so, um, so, and I would also like to introduce our students. So I would like uh, uh, first, um, first year students to show their faces or, to, to maybe to wave their hands, to say hello. So first year students, are you there? Yes. Yes. Hello. 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 Okay. Great. Second year students, are you there? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay, great. And third year students, we'll see someone. Hello. Hi. Yes, hello. Hello. 
morning. Okay. And uh, fourth year students, are there any? No, okay. Uh, probably we don't have room for them, but I sent the links to some of them. Maybe they will join us later. Okay, we have 78 people now. Um, all right, so thank you all for coming. And uh, let's start our event. Uh, I suggest that we should start with Carolyn. So Carolyn, you're welcome to present your poems and uh, yourself. All right, I'm going to look real quickly for my little PowerPoint here, just a second, and then I'll see if I can share my screen. So that um, we can... Where is it? Uh, yeah. At the bottom of the page somewhere, demonstration. Yeah, I have it now. So I'm going to go down here to the share screen and see if I can get my PowerPoint all the way over to you guys. Let's see if it works. It might take a moment. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, isn't technology incredible? I, I just can't believe that I'm talking yeah. all the way over to you guys in Ulan Ude. And I can share a PowerPoint that quickly. And also, it's just fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Tatiana. Yeah. And it's just so exciting to see all of your faces and to get to share some work with you. So we're having a lot of snow today in Fairbanks, Alaska and the internet can get a little unstable sometimes. So I'm sorry if my voice gets really weird or hopefully <laughs> nothing will disconnect, but um, now and then it may, see that, may say that the internet is, connection is unstable. All right, so um, I put together just a few photos to go along with some things I'd like to read. And this photo uh, shows you the big impact that it had on me when I got to have my Fulbright at Begeu in 2008 and 9, and again in 2015 and 16. Um, I was interested in Buddhism before I came there, but I learned a lot more about it after I was there. And I brought back this horse flag that was um, hanging from a birch tree outside my house for quite a while. This is where I live. Um, and right now I'm talking to you. Can you see this arrow? Do you see an arrow? Yes. 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 Okay. So up here in the loft, my desk is right by this window. But it doesn't look like this right now. This is September. <laughs> and we have many birch. I have many birches on my property. Um, and later I'll show you what it looks like now. So I just wanted to orient us for a moment. As you know, Alaska is not, it's not contiguous with the United, the, with the lower 48. It's up here next to Canada. And my city of Fairbanks is right about there. And Russia is very close. It's over here, as you can see. Um, the Chukotka Peninsula is right here. And I was born down here in a, the western state of Colorado, in Denver, Colorado, which Denver is right about there. So I grew up in the west, but I always wanted to live in the north, and I don't know why. I always wanted to go to Siberia, and I always wanted to go to Alaska. So when I was, in 30, when I was 34, I decided to move to Alaska, and I came as a teacher. I started as a, as a teacher in a remote Yupik Eskimo village. From that experience came this book, which is now called a memoir. When I wrote it, it was more a collection of linked essays, but that was before the big memoir craze in the United States. So now it's called a memoir. And um, the hardcover version is here. The book is called Place of the Pretend People, Gifts from a Yupik Eskimo Village. And then the soft cover version came out some years later and it's there. I think I brought a copy to Lanude to the library. So it might be in the library. Um, and I gave some to 
some people there. So I know there are a few anyway at Begeu and around in Nulanude. Later, I wrote another book. This is a book of poems. It's called Up River. And last year, I think some of you might have been at this Christmas celebration last year, I read the first poem in this book. Um, it's a book of poems, and it's actually a sequel to my first book. So it continues the story of my connections with indigenous people in Alaska, Alaska Native peoples. Um, with education, music, the outdoors, uh, and just coming to love a place and, and people so much. So for many years, I taught here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks or UAF. And this statue, it's a bronze statue on the campus reminds me so much of the one at Pegeu of the, I think he was one of the first Buryat people to um, complete a college degree. And he did that in Western uh, Russia. So I have many pictures by that statue in Bege, at Begeu. And this, this is a postcard about UAF and, and this statue reminds me of that. Um, so here's a part of an aerial view of a lot of the campus. Um, I live up on this, Ridge, it's called China Ridge, way back in there. Uh, and I taught for many years on the top floor of this building where the English department is located. I taught literature and writing. And right now I'm taking some time just to work on the book that Tatiana mentioned about Boratia. So I'm not teaching this semester, but I did teach a lot during COVID, all remotely with Zoom and Blackboard and all. If you ever come here, please let me know. I would love to meet any of you if you come to Alaska. And if you come, I'll make sure that you get to go to this museum, the Museum of the North. It's a wonderful museum about the state of Alaska. So this is what my house looks like today. I took this picture at noon today. And it's, uh, we don't have as much snow as usual by now, but it's snowing quite a bit today. And again, I'm up here in this little, uh, in my uh, loft at my desk. And there's my Subaru, which has four wheel drive, luckily, because I have a very steep driveway. So I thought uh, I would share three pieces today if I have time. And the, um, the first one is related to Christmas. Uh, this is um, a Swedish tapestry that, or it's a towel um, that I, put up every Christmas on my front door inside my house. I live in, a, as you can see, it's a log house. Um, and so you're welcome to think about that image as I read. I also did an experiment and I put the manuscript on PowerPoint. It's not very large, so I don't know if you can see it very well, but if you would like to read along, you can, if you'd like to just you know, glance at this and see kind of how the poem looks on the page. Um, that's fine. And you can keep thinking about that other image uh, or anything that the poem brings to mind. This is the poem that Tatiana shared with you in uh, the, the documents that she sent out. And the first version was a little scrambled, but the second one that she put up there uh, is exactly like this one. I don't know. I think you probably have a secret Santa tradition, maybe in Ulanuda, where you might um, say that you're interested in having a secret Santa, and then you draw names from a hat or something, and then you give surprises to that person. Yeah, Tatiana is uh, nodding her head. So I think you have that. So that's what this poem is about. And uh, the person that I wrote this poem for or dedicated it to is Chris. Greenfield Pastro. She was a, a teacher at this school. Before I came to um, Ilanu De the first time, I was one thing I was doing in order to make a living as a writer, besides teaching at the university, was working in the school district with students who had other languages rather than English as their first language. And that's how I got to know Chris. She was a teacher at one of the schools. Secret Santa for Chris Greenfield Pastro. At Fred Myers on Sunday, I inspected the sickly cacti 
and chose the least damaged one for you. It is tiny, snatched from Mexico, Arizona, some other hot place. And I planted it, this porcupine football, in a new small pot in the wrong soil, probably. At least the pot isn't plastic. Neither is it coated in paint. I want the orange pot and the cactus to breathe and all the white prickles. A bright red ribbon hugging tightly the smooth clay vessel has been tied into a bow. You will also find a small card typed to keep you from recognizing my handwriting. I had a plan to slip this frangible green life through the ice fog and into your mailbox at school this morning. But oh no, it wouldn't fit. Quickly, I unfurled another red ribbon extra long and taped one end to your mail slot and the other to the brown paper bag on the table. I hope you don't pricker yourself. So it was um, <laughs> challenging to me that when I got to school with this poor little cactus in really cold ice fog weather, because of course it was right this time of year now, very and very cold that time, um, I thought I could just slip it into her mail slot, but it was too tall. So I had to keep it in the brown paper bag and then figure out how I could let her know that it was hers. So I did that with a ribbon and there was a table nearby and I was able to stick it there. And I was really afraid that since she couldn't see what it was, if she stuck her hand inside the bag, she might prick her herself. And uh, later I wrote this poem about that. Whoops, I skipped one slide. So um, I'd also like to share a nonfiction short it's a piece, it's an excerpt from the book that I'm working on that Tatiana mentioned about Boryatia. The working title of the book is blue, um, Time and a Blue Hadak, Russia's Boryatia and the Heart of an American. Um, and of course, most Americans don't know the word Hadak um, and they would discover what that was in the book. So um, the book works with the history and the people of Boryatia um, and my experiences there and how those interconnect. Um, and it looks at shamanism and Tibetan Buddhism, Russian Orthodoxy and atheism and thinks a lot about our spiritual connections. Um, it's one of the things I'm really interested in and that I write about is one spiritual connection with, with everything really, with the universe. Um, so this is a photo that you recognize, I'm sure it's up at the Rinpoche Bakcha Datsan, Lucia, Lucia Gora. It's my favorite Datsan. I visited many in um, Ulan Ude and, and several in other parts of Buryatia, but I must have been, this is my favorite. And partly it's because of this amazing view out to the Selenga. Um, so I have a piece that I wrote. Uh, it's, as I said, it's a nonfiction short. And um, my book is a mixture of chapters. Uh, it's literary or creative nonfiction. So it's all about real people, real places, real events. And I'm a character in the book. Um, but mixed with the chapters are short pieces that might have been poems or could be poems. Um, and this is one, this one's, I wrote it originally, this one as a poem, but then I changed to how it looks on the page. So here's how it fits into the book. My dear friends in Boryatia, I want to tell you this. Eva was a whale biologist, poet, essayist, and creative writing teacher who lived in Homer, Alaska. She passed away at age 53 in a long battle with cancer. Message to Eva, for Eva Salidas, 1963 to 2016. The day they carried your ashes to the ocean with singing, I was singing for you too from Siberia. Perhaps I hoped that you could hear or somehow see as I boarded Marshuka 97 
and rode it through the city and up and up and up until we reached my favorite Datsan in all of Ulanudeh, Rinpoche Gbaksha Datsan, Lisa Gora, Bald Mountain. Up here, I like to gaze out upon the river Selenga and all the hills and rooftops, and in my mind retrace the river's windings, like your writings and your energy, from Mongolia north into the city center and on through grasslands and mountains until the Selenga has morphed into a braided delta and become, at last, a part of the ancient blue and sacred Lake Baikal. Like a step eagle taking wing, I send a kiss into the deep view and circle the seven stupas, bowing high and low to each with its bright whiteness. Then inside the Buddhist shop, 10 rubles are transformed into a tea light. I walk to a tiny yellow roof temple, each wall transparent plexiglass protecting from the wind where Buryats and Russians and anyone at all can bring a candle and light it for the essence of the person who has passed beyond this world and is moving toward another rebirth. I touch my wick of ivory wax to the heat of another wick and place your bit of fire on the metal tree of filigree that rises like a globe with many arms, like a lotus blossom. Out again in sunshine, I pull slowly on the rope that hangs beneath the huge bronze Buddha spell and hear a single tone, feel it vibrate in my body as each human pull sends this incantation deep across all boundaries. Then my feet are walking together with other feet around a U of simple wood and metal prayer wheels. All our right hands reach out to touch each wheel and spin it, twirling, whirling, hurtling the canisters, Tibetan and Buryat prayers for wisdom and compassion. And my own prayer songs for you out into the universe. Oh, Eva. Um, second that part is covered up by something from zoom this is oh eva how it helps to make this message peace and light be with you Dorogaya krasata dear beauty and of course for you all i don't have to tell you any of this little part at the end of the poem with the pronunciation and the definitions well the way to pronounce these words but before I would read this poem to an American or an English speaking audience, I would probably give a little more context to it using some of these ideas and words at the end. So the last piece I wanna read comes out of COVID-19 and all of us all around the world have something in common now, which is experiencing this incredibly tragic and powerful pandemic. Um, so like you, I was trapped at home a lot. Uh, I, did, I wasn't one of those people who had a lot of time on their hands. Because as I said, I was teaching remotely and I had to learn a lot of things in, that, in order to do that well. Um, and then I was also trying to work on my own writing and of course just survive as a person. Um, so I wrote some poems about COVID as time went on. And actually I have, I have notes for many more poems, but I didn't have time to write all the ones I wanted to. I thought I would share this one with you. Um, it might give you some insights into life in Fairbanks and life for someone like me, who is a little older than you guys. And um, also I live by myself and that was a challenge for me in COVID, I spend a lot of time alone, but not to have anyone that I could go spend holidays with or my birthday um, or go to readings or concerts. Uh, it, was, it was pretty isolating and at times quite a challenge. So this is the last piece I'm gonna read. It's called How Little We Know. 
take you over to the manuscripts. Let's see if I can move something out of the way here, just a second. Okay. Oh, and by the way, um, every week I have looked on on the Russian site stopcoronavirus.ru uh, to see the numbers for the Republic of Buryatia. And from the very first week that COVID started, in my, in my weekly calendar, I wrote down the number of cases in Alaska, the number of cases in Fairbanks, and the number of cases in Buryatia. And I also wrote, as time went on, of course, how many people had died. So I've been doing that now for whatever this is. I forget how long it's been now. Um, nearly two years, I guess. Every week, writing those numbers down and comparing the numbers for Alaska with Buryatia. It's been pretty interesting. So I also, when I wrote my poems, wrote down what day it was of the pandemic and the date. How little we know, day 55, May 5th, 2020. Today is Tuesday, and I mailed a Mother's Day card to my sister, whose grown son is 31, and he's getting unemployment money now, I hope, in Los Angeles. He's the only young person in our small family. I'm 68 and live alone, and usually I'd be working at my laptop on a weekday, but I really wanted to mail the card so that maybe it would reach Nan by Sunday. She's a lawyer at the Pentagon, and her work, tied to COVID-19 since March, has been stressing her out, major league. At the post office, I dropped the card in the mailbox, and a slender young black woman behind plexiglass helped me mail a few other things. I wore a mask, she did not, and buy some letter stamps those stunning wild and scenic river ones. And she said they were out of postcard stamps, sorry. And I felt bad that she was pregnant and having to work in person during COVID. I'd never seen her at the post office before and not at the one in downtown Fairbanks either. But maybe she's glad to have a job during these times. Anyway, after sliding back into the car, my left hip hurt so much when I lift it in, and now I don't know whether I'll be able to get a hip replacement this summer or not. I squeezed a bit of sanitizer on my fingertips with the tiny bottle I found last weekend in a cupboard. How quickly the alcohol evaporates. Then I drove across town to the Great Harvest Bread Company. For the first time ever, I'd called ahead this morning to reserve two giant cinnamon rolls with frosting and pay with my Visa card. I had a coupon code for minus $5 that, um, that expires this Friday, and I knew there wouldn't be time to go there anytime this week except today. I parked near the entrance to the bakery cafe and called in with my iPhone. And a cheerful female voice answered. Where are you? The person asked. I'm parked at the curb right in front in a silver Subaru, and I have silver white hair. Oh yes, I can see you through the window talking on your phone. I'll be right there. In less than a minute, a sprightly young blonde woman walked out the door carrying two brick red cardboard boxes in her arms. She handed the boxes to me through the window, which I had rolled down and gave a big smile with her eyes. She wore a mask, I did not, but I will next time now that I know how this takeout thing works. And on the way home, I stopped at Buddy's house the neighbor who snowplowed my long, steep driveway so many times this winter on his fat tire four-wheeler with chains. Luckily, Buddy and Alona, his wife, were outdoors when I drove up, cleaning out the cars, Buddy said. So it was easy to hand him the big box cinnamon roll in a plastic bag over the fence. I wore a mask, he did not. He smiled and joked about their smart new puppy. And later, Ilona, who's German, texted me, thank you, this is a very good, lovely treat, it's so delicious, thank you, thank you. At home, I washed my hands and disinfected the kitchen countertop and washed my hands again. By then, it was two o'clock, and instead of making a proper lunch, 
hastily I cut my giant cinnamon roll in half and then in smaller pieces and put the pieces on a plate. Then I sat on the screen porch in the blessed sun, eating ravenously and licking the cream cheese frosting from my fingers. And I thought with relief and sudden sadness, little do any of these people know how much they've helped me endure another social distance day, another Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Let's thank Carolyn. Okay, right. So questions, um, we can have some questions. <laughs> yes, no? Okay, maybe you'll think of your questions while the other speakers talk and um, overcome your shyness. <laughs> okay, and then ask questions after all the speakers um, are through. Okay, so let's uh, move on. And uh, so I invite Carol Davis for giving her uh, talk. Carol, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I miss Ulan Day, and I do hope to come back. I, I don't have any slides. I didn't even think of that. I apologize. Uh, it's finals for me. I gave my last final at the college today. I have lots of grading and uh, I just didn't think of it. Um, a little bit about me. I have a very English sounding name and not English at all. My grandmother who died when I was a baby, is, her name was Anna Elkina, and she was born in uh, or lived in St. Petersburg, which is unusual for a Jewish woman. And my grandfather was uh, born in the border area between Russia and Ukraine. I, however, did not grow up speaking Russian, sadly. My grandfather, uh, my father's father lived in New York. I was born in Northern California near San Francisco. My parents did not, my parents only learned English when they went to school, but their first language was Yiddish, which is written in Hebrew script. And it is like old German, uh, we are Jewish. I later found out that the family name, and I don't know where this came from, my grandfather's name was uh, David Uchito, and we don't know where that came from. Uh, so that's a little bit. I, we moved to Europe when I was very small and lived in Europe. I lived all over, and, um, and that was part of my wanting to apply for a Fulbright so that my own children could have that experience. So in 1996, I packed up the three children, David, Jacob, and Hannah. Uh, they were five, eight, and 11, and we moved to St. Petersburg for a year. My husband did not come. And, um, and that started my, I had come to <laughs> Leningrad when I was a college student. I studied uh, Russian literature. I teach English and creative writing, but my degrees are in Russian literature and Slavic literatures. Um, and we moved to St. Petersburg and that started my, I think I've been in Russia and lived in Russia maybe 10 times now. And, um, and am eager to come back. And hopefully when COVID lifts a little, I will be back. So I, um, I, I can do a screen share and uh, you can read. Uh, I actually um, was a dancer when I was young. I took a leave in graduate school and joined a, a company. I studied ballet as a child and then was a modern dancer. But um, I fell in love with Russian literature and that was, that was it for me. Um, I still write a lot about Russia and I'm working on a new manuscript called Below Zero. And the core of that uh, book, yeah, poems about Ulan Uday. And, um, but my 
book that won the T.S. Eliot Prize was about St. Petersburg, living there, watching my children in, in another country and getting used to it. Um, so since Carolyn read a COVID piece, I think I'll start with a COVID piece um, and then we will go from there. So let me scroll down. Um, Don't worry, I won't read all these poems. Poetry in another language is very difficult. I also translate some. I not long ago finished translating a poem with um, Maxim Schreier. He teaches in Boston, he's from Moscow. And uh, he did the first draft of the translation and then I started working on it to make it more poetry uh, in English translation. This is called of COVID-19. Flags painted by children crisscross a small front garden, fecund with giant banana leaves and poppies two feet high after surprising April rain. Each time I run past this house, more and more flags crowd the line, a kind of talisman for what must be a house full of school children, home, restless, their mother increasingly frazzled as she juggles work and now homeschooling a brood who seem to multiply whenever she turns her back. I want to scold the flags for not social distancing. This morning, a woman on her cell phone did not see me and I yelled, I admit it, afraid she would bump into me as I jogged by. It feels like months and months confined when it's only six weeks, another eight until the end of the semester. And how can I possibly grade all those papers when all I want is to collapse on the couch and watch movies? A year ago, January, it seems like a decade ago, I squished in a Jeep with four Siberian colleagues for a drive to Lake Baikal. Their trees dotted the desolate road, their branches strung with Tibetan prayer flags. Bright blue hatnas, silk scarves, stuck in the wind. The driver tossed coins from his window. An hour later, we stopped to drop rubles in the lap of a Buddha. Now in Los Angeles, I unfurl a hatna out my apartment window pleading with it to bring compassion and calm, both in short supply. So this was an early COVID poem when we thought it would be over soon. But, uh, and I am a runner, uh, usually very early in the morning, just as it's getting dawn, uh, I go out for a run. So um, I think I'll go to this poem. I've been fortunate and had a few grants from the National Park Service, which is the American Parks. Uh, and this one was in Nebraska, in the middle of the country. And I'd never been there before. I've been to Russia, seen more than I have in various states in the United States. And uh, Nebraska is very flat. It's mostly farmland. And I felt very different there. So this poem is about that it is autobiographical and there are some uh, words that need translating. So my um, great grandfather was what is called a shochet, which is a ritual slaughterer. Um, I translated it as butcher, but that's not accurate. It was too long to translate it. Uh, it is a word from Hebrew. And uh, the Pale of Settlement, you probably know the area between the changed borders, Russia and Ukraine, where they lived. Um, a couple of other words, shtetl is a word for the little villages that were all over Eastern Europe and Russia, um, mostly occupied by Jews. And the pogroms were massacres uh, 
largely in Ukraine, Poland, um, some in Russia of uh, killing of Jews. And I think that's a bit all you need to know. It's called the butcher. Oh, a uh, Ben means son of, and it is, uh, so this was my um, a great grandfather's name in Hebrew, the butcher. Yonatan ben Yosef, Jonathan, son of Joseph, was a shochet, a butcher in the Pale of Settlement. With a smooth blade, he slit the throats of steers, drained the blood into a bucket, salted the meat to make it fully kosher. He didn't own the cattle, only slaughtered it. Shtetl life was brutal, the threat of pogroms constant. I know only that and the eyes that pierce the photo on my mantle. So savage, my children took it down and buried it in a cupboard. Maybe those eyes blackened when his son was conscripted into the Tsar's army, landing in a Cossack unit. A scrawny Jew with a caterpillar mustache who couldn't match the sabers or vodka of his fellow soldiers. Six years later, he slipped out of the army, walked to a train, a boat to cross the ocean. This must be the wandering gene that propelled my father to leave the comforts of America to help rebuild Europe and later flung me afield to Russia with my own children. Now in Nebraska, I think of these men buried on both coasts, far from the center of the country. The prairie stores its own sad histories, winters that smothered the hopes of homesteaders, plagues that devoured the crops, dust storms that darkened the skies. This morning, after the thunder has crumpled to a whimper and the rain quiets, the chant of the red-winged blackbird bounces from green ash to red cedar and the partridge pea flaunts its yellow. It is impossible to remain gloomy, even for this granddaughter of immigrants fed on mistrust and shadows. Okay. So um, let me read one more poem and then we'll see um, how the time is. Um, and let me explain a little. I uh, love classical music and listen to it a lot. And um, this poem uh, is in the title, The Rachmaninoff Vespers, which is a favorite piece of music. Um, Yom Kippur is a Jewish holiday. It's the most serious holiday. It's always in the fall. We have a lunar calendar, so the dates change, but it's usually September or October. Um, they say that during this, there is 10 days of this between these two very serious holidays. And the story is that that is when God has the book of life open and decides who is going to live and who is going to die. And I reference that. The poem actually uh, uh, came to me from an experience I had in Novgorod. Uh, I went there many, several times to lecture at the university and um, went to a sabor uh, there and had this experience. So I think that you need to know. I um, ended up, uh, this poem has been published and uh, in the first versions of the poem, I had it, in more regular stanzas, but when I was revising it, it felt to me that this poem needed space. So you can see it's spaced out over the page and there's very, very little punctuation. So I use the spacing partly as punctuation. On the eve of Yom Kippur, I listened to the Rachmaninoff Vespers. 
Is every portal to heaven equal? These 10 days when the book of life lies open before the pages flutter shut. The reeds are on both sides of the river, but the choice is not always ours to make, to cross or not, to remain where we are or chance fleeing. An uneasy marriage of expectation and guilt so many temptations to succumb to. Once in Novgorod, I stumbled into a funeral service. All I intended was to gaze at the cathedral's stained glass windows. The Orthodox priest swung the censer toward the congregation. Though I was standing in the back, he caught my eye and knew I did not belong. Now, on the eve of this Jewish holiday, I listen to the Rachmaninoff Vespers, and when I look up, the windows have blurred into waves of blue and gold, darkened by centuries of incense. So, and I have time for one more, maybe? Um, yes, sure. Okay. So um, I've often gone to artist colonies, especially, though continued even without my children being young. Uh, they are the United States. There are maybe about 15 of them. They are places for writers, composers, visual artists uh, to go and work. Uh, away from our jobs and our families. And my last fellowship, I've been very fortunate and had many of them, was in or the state of Oregon. I know um, I went to university and graduate school, partly at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and partly up in Washington state near the Canadian border. And this was the state below it, Oregon, but it was on the east side, which is more desert. And I had never been there. And um, so uh, I got a lot of work done there and wrote mostly uh, about what I was seeing. Um, there's, there's a literary journal called Museum of Americana that publishes a uh, poetry that has a relationship mostly a lot about folklore but about also nature I've read a lot about nature and this poem uh, was published this year uh, in this journal uh, and it comes from Summer Lake is uh, the area in Oregon where I was this is called February on the horizon the snow retreats until it's a lace collar circling the ridge. A few white strands spool down the mountainside. On the marsh, fresh scat. Last night I heard or invented a coyote howling. With so few people here, I've taken to counting things. One owl in a mountain alder, 10 marsh swallows in the scrub, who protest being disturbed. On the other side of Summer Lake, a light blinks. Ranger station, cabin. Warning signs are everywhere. Too dry a January. Last year's fire scars the hillside with centuries of blackened trunks. I fear for the summer months. So as you know, I'm sure you've read uh, in many parts of the United States, there have been terrible fires in California, definitely. And in this region in Oregon, the year before I was there, there were bad fires. And then the month after I left, they were snowed in and couldn't get out. Um, so kind of wild, uh, wild weather. All right. So um, shall I open it? Should we open it up for uh, questions? Please oh. uh, be ask anything you want. I'm perfectly happy to try and answer. 
have a question. Please. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you start writing poems? Uh, well, I wrote bad poetry when I was a high school student, pretty dreadful poetry. And then I stopped and started up again in my early 20s, uh, actually just when I was finishing my master's degree in Russian literature. Um, and then I just, I know this sounds silly, but I knew then that was my calling and I, and it went from there. And then when I won the T.S. Eliot prize, it was a shock for me. Um, they had the press that ran the prize had something like 550 manuscripts submitted and they chose mine and that really launched my career and I had three books with this university has just been was closed last year you would Universities in the United States, like in Russia, are don't have enough money, and uh, sadly, the university closed the press. But that was the start of uh, poetry. But I've I I I teach creative writing, but I think also being a reader is a very very good way to become a writer, and that's how I became a, a writer. I did not go through a creative writing program. Um, long answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? No? My children have not been back to Russia. They have forgotten their Russian. Now, I'll mm -hmm. just say one thing. Uh, my oldest son is a visual artist. Um, my middle son works for a nonprofit helping people with disabilities and homeless people. And my younger daughter is finishing building a little house way up in the mountains uh, with no electricity on, uh, and her mother cannot hammer a nail. So she, where did she get this talent? It wasn't from me. Those are my uh, three children. And I became a babushka two years ago. Wow, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Hey, interesting. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, so you. we'll proceed to Monique Zamir. Monique, you're welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me and having me here. Very exciting to um, be here and, and to hear Carol and Carolyn. And I'm very excited to, to hear, hear, hear your, who you share your, your translations and, and stories um, later. Um, <clears throat> So let's see. So, so as um, Tatiana said, I, I actually live in um, Texas. I'm in Austin, Texas, which is um, right in the middle of the capital of Texas. Um, so very, very different climate from um, Alaska and from Siberia. I think it was like 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit today. I don't know offhand what that would be in Celsius. Um, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so, so it's been fairly warm here. Um, I've, I've lived here for five years, but um, I, I came here from Oklahoma, Oklahoma, where I studied in Oklahoma State, which is where um, I had the, the pleasure of meeting Tatiana and where we became friends uh, when she was on her Fulbright scholarship there, or one, one of her Fulbright scholarships. Um, and before that, I was from New York, where I grew up um, in Long Island, so I'm pretty close to uh, New York City. Um, so yeah, so so I'm I actually don't I studied I got my graduate degree in poetry in Oklahoma State, um, but I'm I actually don't teach, I'm not I'm not in the um, university world anymore, not formally. Um, so so I I work in the private sector for for a company in, in um, product and web design, um, but 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 I still do poetry on the side and I try to always fit it in, um, in my free time and continue working on it. Um, so. Um, so, so I guess before I was going to get into um, the reading, um, Tatiana thought it would be a good idea to talk to you guys about uh, Hanukkah a little bit. I'm also Jewish, um, so, so I don't celebrate Christmas. Um, uh, so so I'll, I'll just 
talk a little bit um, about that. So Hanukkah is, um, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with it. It's a Jewish holiday. Um, doesn't really have, um, it, it happens to fall around Christmas every year, around November or December, um, but, but it's a very different um, story. It, it, it's kind of a historical holiday. Um, so it happened in uh, like thousands of years ago in ancient times and around uh, uh, 200, 100 uh, BC. So it's shortly before um, the birth of Christ. Um, uh, in the in the in, in Jerusalem, actually, and so um, a uh, Greek Syrian uh, Empire had taken over the, the Jewish land in Jerusalem, um, and so so for a while it was all peaceful, and they let the Jewish people still practice their religion, and it was fine. And then eventually, a new king took over, and he outlawed the Jewish religion. He didn't want to let anyone practice the Jewish religion. He wanted them to worship the Greek gods. Um, and so it became very violent. Soldiers came in, in, in into the city of Jerusalem and, and they caused a lot of destruction and suffering. And, and one of the things they did was they destroyed the holy temple, which, um, which, which still you, you can see the walls left from, um, from, from, from the holy temple in Jerusalem today. Um, but but they uh, they didn't destroy the building then, but but they desecrated it and they made it unholy. And this was like this the holiest site in the Jewish religion, so it was a big deal. The the holiest temple in Judaism. Um, so 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 unfortunately they did like desecrate it and they they did all these horrible things to it. Um, and so the Jewish people started their own rebellion to try and drive um, the Syrian Greeks out. Of, of Jerusalem. And so it took them a few years. This was a great army, but they were able to drive them out just like, like a small like, like rebel army were able to drive them out. And so finally, after all these years, they drove them out and they went back to the temple to clean it and to cleanse it and to make it, um, make it back, bring it back to its holy, um, you know, like, like original state. Um, and so when they were looking for oil to light the the, the candles the, which was called the menorah which is just like a lantern in, in hebrew um they only found enough oil because then they, they of course they used oil right we didn't, they didn't have like wax candles um so um they only found enough oil for one night and they lit the oil and the oil lasted eight days and so that's the miracle of hanukkah that when when they went back to recover the temple they, there was only enough oil that should have lasted one, one day. It lasted eight days. And so they declared it a miracle. And that's why we celebrate um, Hanukkah every year. Um, and so I have my menorah that, that I thought I would just show you. Um, so you can see it has uh, four candle, candle holders on each side, one for each night. And you have the ninth candle in the middle it's not always in the middle, but uh, this one is in the middle. It's a little bit higher, um, a little bit higher than the others. And this is called the helper candle. So in the first night, you would light um, this candle in the middle and the first candle over here for the first night. And every night, you light a new candle until you get to the eighth night of Hanukkah. Um, so, so it's a fun holiday. You eat also because of the oil. You eat, that's why in Hanukkah, we eat a lot of fried foods. Just to celebrate the miracle of the oil. Um, so anyway, so, so, so that's Hanukkah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fun holiday. It, it just finished a couple weeks ago, but it always is a little bit different um, when it, wherever it falls on the calendar. Um, okay, so, so I guess I'll, I will read. Um, I'll try to share my screen. It took me a little bit of time to uh, <laughs> to to get Zoom to work on my computer, so hopefully it doesn't make my computer crash. <laughs> um, but 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 if it does, I'll, I'll, I'll be trying on my phone. I don't I don't think it will. Um, so, uh, so can you share? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I didn't want it to. Uh, okay, well, that's fine. 
Um, so, so I just have a few poems here to read. Um, I don't, they're, they're mostly kind of about the, the ones I picked are mo mostly about my, my like family history or a little bit about like religion. I, I, I write about a lot of different topics, but these are just the ones I, I chose for today. And so the, um, this first poem called Even the Stone Will Keep is, is kind of based off of a family um, story um, that, that I, I, I was told that I can, I can share after. Uh, or if I can share it now. It was, it was also inspired by a poet um, named Yehuda Amichai, who, who is, um, he, he, he is like a, a poet from Israel, Jewish poet. Um, and, and he became pretty, he was one, one of the more famous poets to, in recent history to come out of Israel. Um, he, he gained international acclaim. Um, if, if you're interested in poetry, he was, he was definitely a poet I would recommend. Um, I enjoy reading him quite a, quite a lot. He's very talented. Um, and so this was based off of, or inspired by a, a poem of his that I read. Um, but it also talks about a story I heard from my mom about um, some of my relatives, m most of my family, I guess I didn't really talk about my background, job, but, uh, but m most of my family lives in Israel. I actually do have a great grandfather who came from Russia. Um, but, but a lot of my family is from the Middle East. So half my family came to Israel from Iraq. My dad was born in Baghdad and, and in, in Iraq, there's actually a very ancient um, Jewish community. Jews have been there for like over 2000 years. Um, and and the, my mom's side is kind of from all over the place. Um, but but anyway, so, so I, I had so, some relatives um, this was like many years ago, wanted to see if they could find the gravestones of some, some of our um, relatives from a few generations ago and who were buried in this ancient cemetery in Jerusalem. And they went to visit the cemetery and a lot of the green stone, gravestones were destroyed. And um, the, there, there were two relatives buried in this cemetery and, and their two gravestones were intact. And so it was this very, um, it's a very, very emotional experience. So, so I wrote a poem about it. Um, okay. Even the stone will keep. The more I look at this stone, the more it erodes and down to the word amen, engraved a thousand years ago. It came from an ancient Jewish cemetery destroyed many times over, a cemetery my family once sought. They found the gravestones, their blood intact and every other gravestone in the area destroyed. I don't know what this means. I keep an eye on my stone. I witness every way of mouthing amen. A stone older than the sum of all hands it passes through still hums its quiet, steady melody. The story goes like this. I can't tell where my finger ends and the stone begins. Uh, okay, so. You just following me. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so, so this second poem um, over here um, is called In Tel Aviv. Um, in, when, when I was getting my um, bachelor's degree, I did a summer study abroad program in, in Israel. Um, and so this is kind of just about some of my experiences there. Um, this is my grounding moment. The way a whistle screeches by the ocean seaweed tangled with the crabs, I am uprooted. My prayer is condensed on contact and I watch the drummers as they press their noses to ground. The black coffee slowly seeps under my eyes, the native tongue dancing around my nose. On the fringe, I hold no one but myself. The way I pace changes constantly. One hour I am murmuring, the next defending my right to do so. I look inward. My vision has no flowers, no rabbits smiling from the road, only toads silent and wandering for sunlight. Effervescent and unwound, I count the ways in which I gather. My hope is to be the clown, sitting atop a light pole, looking at nobody, only pirating my own glance, my own sojourn into the ocean. Um, okay. Okay, uh, so this next poem is called uh, Yom Kippur. Um, 
it's, it's also about the same holiday um, that, that Carolyn just read a poem. So, so I, I, won't, I won't go too much detail in, into um, the, that holiday, but, but it's one of the holiest holidays um, in the Jewish religion. Um, so, so it's just about that. Uh, Yom Kippur. As the day repeats itself, the violence of the hour is microscopic. One insect in tall grass effaces my nose, my hair, my eyelids. I try to pray. My throat closes. I have nothing. Even my sallow fingers shrivel and brine. The ram's horn blows, but I cannot hear it. I am only sacred in these moments. I bow while singing one two-syllable word for as long as my breath can hold it. I offer peaches to a man who cannot eat them. My eyes slowly greet the sun. The brine effaces the insect, effaces itself. The ram's horn is blowing, and I crane my ear to hear it. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just mention um, that the ram's horn reference here in, in you know, uh, Judaism, um, we use like a ram's horn as kind of an instrument. It's um, I guess I, I probably not, I won't really do a great job of explaining it, but you blow out of the ram's horn um, during some of the ho uh, holy holidays and, and it's uh, like a blessing to, to hear the ram's horn on, on these holidays. Um, and so in Yom Kippur, it's one of those holidays where you <coughs> the rabbi um, uh, blow blowing the ram's horn. Um, and so this is um, uh, my last poem. Um, so, so like I mentioned, uh, my like one half of my family came from Iraq and they had been there for hundreds of years, not longer. Um, so, so this is just kind of based off of some of the stories I've heard um, from uh, from my family and, and some things that I know. Um, about, about our experiences there um, in Baghdad. It's winter, my grandmother strains yogurt outside. It's winter, we bathe in rose water. The yogurt thickens as the wind blows A minor through an ancient synagogue built, destroyed, and rebuilt again. Our noses breathe Havdalah spices. We leave our bread behind, our cousin imprisoned for a crime even the guards can't name. Death sentence, release, run. The wind never saw our people leaving. We who slept on rooftops with you, we who charred fish on brushwood fires with you. Our feet soar, we tell ourselves, for millennia spent standing still. Funny how quickly the eye loses its hand. Now in the land of milk and cactus fruit, the yogurt has thickened to leaven. Sit under the olive tree, salt of the Dead Sea on our lips. Let's talk about the home we'll never see again. Um, I realize that there are some things I should maybe define um, here. So, so have dala spices. Um, that, that's something that's traditionally done on, on the Sabbath. And so the end of Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, um, which is on, um, Saturday, uh, a Saturday evening, um, in, in order to like, like, you know, like, like end the, the, the Sabbath, um, you, you breathe in these, like a spice blend. Um, so, so, so that, that's what, uh, that is. And, oh, and, and Levin, um, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have something like it, it's, it's, it's just like, like thick, um, it's, it's kind of like kefir, um, so, so it's, it's just like yogurt, it's really just yogurt, but thicker. So it's, it's just yogurt that's been strained longer. And so there's kind of this blend between yogurt, like this tart of yogurt and, and, um, um, the, the texture of like a soft, like threadable cheese. So anyway, so that's what it is. That's, it's really common in the Middle East. Um, that was my last poem. So, um, yeah. Well, Thank you, Monique. It was very interesting. As for me, I got like, flashes of different culture and different cities. Oh, wow. wonderful. <laughs> and some flashes of our memories together. <laughs> right, okay. Any questions to Monique? <clears throat> no? 
All right. So um, maybe you will have them later for all of us. Um, so uh, here I close the first part of our meeting, yeah, uh, devoted to um, American speakers and American poetry. And now we pass over to the second part, devoted to uh, recitals and translations of poems by the students of Briat State University. Um, so, and we will start with um, a reciting um, and translating some poems. Um, and we'll start with group 18411 with uh, Sveta Sanjeeva. So she's going to introduce the poem and herself. Sveta, are you there? Sanjeeva Sveta. This? Sorry, sorry, I'm here. Yes, okay. And uh, the person who is responsible for reading the translation of the same poem, Zandinov Yegor. Get ready. All right. Christmas. Go ahead. Yeah. Christmas long ago by Donna Maroney. Frosty days and ice till nights. Fir trees streamed with tiny lights. Sound of sleigh bells in the snow. That was Christmas long ago. Tykes on sleds and shouts of glee. Icy window filigree. Sugar plums and candle glow, part of Christmas long ago. Footsteps stealthy on the stair, sweet voiced carols in the air, stocking hanging in a row, tell of Christmas long ago. Starry nights so still and blue, good friends calling out to you, life so fact will always slow for dreams of Christmas long ago. Okay, thank you. And the translation, Igor, are you there? Yes. Холодные дни, студенные ночи, лучики солнца сквозь кроны ели, звон бобинцов саней — это Рождество давних времен. Укряжка собак и радостный крик, узоры на окне в мороз, огонек свечки и леденцы — часть Рождества давних времен. Мокрый след на ступеньке, пение нежных голосов, Рождественские носки на камине говорят о Рождестве давних времен. Безмолвные лазурные ночи, друзья, зовущие к себе, и долгая жизнь впереди, как сон в Рождество давних времен. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. So, the next poem is read by um, Vika Grigorieva. Mm -hmm. And the translation by Dmitry Koprianov. <clears throat> the first Christmas, Marion Swinger. Uh, it never... um, we have a presentation, yeah, for this poem. So. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Um. Right. Okay, so Vika is going to read and I'm going to show you the slides. Okay. The First Christmas by Marion Swinger. It never snows at Christmas in the dry and dusty land. Instead of freezing blizzards, there are palms and drifting sands. And years ago, a stable and a most unusual star, and three wise men who follow it by camel, not by car, while sleeping on the quiet hills, a shepherd gave a cry in a crowd of angels in the silent starlit sky. In the stable, Oxenas stood very still and calm and gazed upon the baby, safe and snug in Mary's arms. And Joseph, lost in shadows, face lit by an oil lamp's glow, stood wondering that first Christmas day two thousand years ago. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and the translation by Dmitry. Dima, I have just one. Go ahead. В этом сухом и пыльном краю нет снега на Рождество. Здесь пальмы развесили листья звездой над белым зубучим песком. 
Три мудреца, облекомые светом яркой и далекой звезды, шли на верблюдах сквозь крик пастуха, что спал в это время на тихой вершине. Скрикнул пастух, на небо взглянул. Он видел там ангелов, кругом восставших. А в центре Мария с младенцем в руках. В тени угасал Иосиф уставший. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was very beautiful. Okay, and the third poem is read by Tabihanova Victoria and the translation by uh, Alexei Nigeliev. Hello, it's nice to meet you, Carol, Caroline and Monique. Uh, my name is Victoria Tabihanova. I'm a first year student and we are all very happy to see you here with us. So I would like to um, recite a poem by Thomas Bailey Aldridge, Chris Kringle. Can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> Just as the moon was fading amid her mystery rings, and every stocking was stuffed with childhood precious things. Old Chris Kringle looked around and saw on the elm tree bough high hung an oriole's nest, lonely and empty now. Quite a stalking, he laughed, hung up there on a tree. I didn't suppose the birds expected a present from me. Then old Chris Kringle, who loves a joke as well as the best, dropped a handful of snowflakes into the oriole's nest. And that's that. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Vika. And let's listen to the translation. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can perfectly hear you. That's great, that's great. Um, so before I start, I want to say that it's an honor for me to share uh, with all of you my translation, and I'm glad that I have such an opportunity. So um, I'll start. Среди туманной пелены луна тихонько притаилась. И стали детские полны вещами, что детишкам снились. Окинув взглядом все вокруг, среди красивых листьев вязы, увидел дедушка Мороз гнездо пустым, что оказалось. Но тут же дедушка с улыбкой сказал себе, не думал я, что птичкам тоже захотелось иметь подарок от меня. И старый дедушка Мороз, что любит шутки и веселье, снежинок гнездышко нанес и уложил красиво в упоении. Thank you very much. Yes. So, um, I really appreciate uh, the job that you have done translating the poems, yeah? These are just uh, second year students, so they actually don't have uh, classes on translation or interpretation yet. So they're going to have them only during the third year, but um, I think they did a really good job. Thank you very much. So, and uh, the third thing uh, from students would be reading their own Christmas stories. So recently I got interested in uh, the storytelling techniques. Uh, so, and we're doing a little bit of storytelling with uh, the students that I teach. And uh, so we made up some Christmas stories for today. Uh, and the first story will be uh, read by um sorry let me see okay why don't i have it here um uh, so group 18491 uh i think it's kirill right yeah. good evening and good morning uh today i would like to tell you a story that we wrote it's called warm heart and we would like to show you our presentation. Okay. <clears throat> it was Christmas night, very beautiful and quiet. Snow was slowly falling down from the starry sky. Santa came to one of the few polar villages to leave presents for the children. He parked his sleigh near one of the houses. Among, among the many magnificent ice statues, Rudolf the reindeer saw a figure. He tried to warn other reindeers that they were spotted, but the figure appeared in front of him. It was a snowman with 
pieces of coal for buttons and eyes with bright orange care decorating his cold and sad face, Rudolph asked him with curiosity, it is the Christmas night, the best and happiest time of the year. Why are you so sad at this time? The snowman replied, I have a wish and I hope Santa could help me. What do you want? When I was born many years ago, North Pole was the coldest and in the world, the coldest place in the world. But every year I become smaller and smaller due to the climate change. What? It's getting warmer day by day. Could you please give this letter to Santa? Of course I can. When Santa came out the house through the chimney, the snowman froze and stopped moving. Santa was in a rush because there were a lot of presents uh, to deliver. After many hours of work, Santa and his helpers gave away all the presents to every child in the world. Rudolph was very tired. Uh, he was passing by the Christmas tree in Santa's village. He noticed a gingerbread figure of a snowman decorating the tree. A thought struck like a lightning. I completely forgot. He rushed to, the, to Santa and gave him a letter from snowman. Santa attentively read the letter and shook his head. Unfortunately, there is nothing I can do. The Christmas night is over. Rudolph became very, very, very upset, unless, Santa said. A week later, the snowman was watching the news on the TV through the window as usual. It was nothing interesting until the weather broadcast started. We record in unprecedented temperatures right now. According to our estimates, global warming had reduced significantly. Snowman was very cheerful yet surprised because he couldn't even imagine that Santa can give him such a present. It turns out that Santa asked global leaders to reduce pollutions as soon as possible. As a result, greenhouse gas levels had reduced by 25%, thus reversing global warming and making the snowman happy. The end. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you introduced global issues there. That was really interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Kirill. Um, the next story would be from uh, Alina Tarmakhanova. Hi. Hello. Um, um, I'd like to greet uh, Carol, Carolyn, and M M Monique. It's an honor to have you today. And thank you so much. Um, our story called a new friend. In the country called Winter Wonderland, where has been no snow for more than a hundred years, and people that live there have long forgotten what Christmas joy was. In this country lived a lonely boy who had no friends, and his closest person was his grandmother. One day, his grandmother knitted a hat for him. What is it? The boy asked. This is a hat. But it's not a simple hat. It's a special hat that can make your dreams come true, the grandmother said. It was a red pom-pom hat. The boy didn't believe it because, it, because he knew the ma that magic didn't exist. However, on Christmas Eve, he decided to check if it could fulfill his wish. Nicholas put it on, closed his eyes, and whispered softly, Please. Let it snow in a winter wonderland so that I can make a friend. And in the very same moment, he ran to the window, but nothing happened. I knew the magic doesn't exist, thought he and went to bed. The next morning, his grandmother woke him up. Nicholas, wake up, look out the window. He rubbed his eyes and went to the window. The whole city was covered in snow. I can't believe it. He dressed up and went out. The boy right away started making a snowman. In a couple of hours, the snowman was ready. Joy came to the country along with the snow. The snowman turned out to be big and beautiful. The boy was happy. Nicholas got cold and wanted to go home. 
But then he heard a voice. Oh, and where am I? The boy got scared and looked around. Who said that? The voice replied. It's me. It happened to be a snowman. Is that really true? You can speak. The snowman replied. Of course I can. The, the boy ran up to the snowman and said, My name is Nicholas, and what's your name? I don't know, the snowman replied. If you come up with a name for me, then I will be your, your best friend. The boy was extremely happy. I'll call you Crystal, the snowman said. I came to life because it was your Christmas wish. The boy was so happy that his wish that his wish came true. I want to please all children in the world and I and I will fill full all their wishes at Christmas. As you may know, the boy's name was Nicholas. Now all over the world he's known as Santa Claus. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that was an interesting twist about St. Nicholas. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yeah. All right. And the third story is by <clears throat> Vika Badmaeva. Hello, everyone. My name is Vicky. We're glad to see uh, our guests. And now I'd like to tell you about uh, to tell you a Christmas story. Can you see my screen? Yep, but it's at the end. Is it, are the slides moving? No. No? Back, back, please. Uh -huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, since ancient times, the famous Santa Claus lived in the North Pole. Not only lived, but also created toys for Christmas. Santa Claus had assistants, elves. There were so many of them that it was difficult to name them and even more to remember them. So all the elves wore caps of different colors. The main character of our tale is naturally also an elf. He wore a green cap and the four were simply called the green. He was the kind of funny elf, but there, were one, uh, but, we were, uh, but there was one little problem. He was afraid of the heights. No one was terrified of heights like him because all the elves helped Santa Claus carry Christmas gifts through the chimney. Although it seemed that houses are not too high, the elf was still afraid of this, and before only he stayed at the North Pole when all the elves helped Santa. One day, one of the elves called, caught a cold. Yes, you've heard right. Elves, like people, get sick. So one of the elves fell ill, and another elf, that is our main character, uh, had to replace him on Christmas night because all, uh, because all the children in the world should receive their gifts. In the middle of the night, in one of the towns of America, elves and Santa Claus were delivering gifts. That day, he personally helped Santa but he couldn't overcome his fear and go into the house through the chimney to leave gifts for the child. Santa Claus knew about his fear, so he climbed down the chimney by himself and the elf was waiting for him on the ground. Some time passed and Santa wasn't coming. The elf was worried if something had happened to him. It was a mystery to be solved. What happened to Santa Claus? Time went on and on and nothing happened. The elf had already decided that something terrible had happened. Having gained strength and courage, he climbed the roof of the house 
although he was pretty much afraid. With great difficulty, he managed to do it. And looking down, his heart sank into his boots. Then he got into the chimney and fell down. And in that house near the Christmas tree stood Santa Claus with a smile on his face. He praised him for the courage and the fact that he overcame his fear. Um, and in the end, I'd like to say that, uh, that I wish we all would overcome our fears in New Year and I wish a uh, Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vika. Yes, great. So, um, okay, so maybe our speakers have uh, questions to students. Any comments, maybe? Wonderful to hear you. Okay. Yeah. I have a question, Tatiana. Sure. I noticed that in the second year students, when they read their um, poems in English and then there were the translations, all the translators were male. Was that just by accident? Why was that? Um, yeah, I think what, it was by accident. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> Um, well, basically, mm -hmm. a kind of a competition because uh, um, so each group was assigned uh, to translate a poem, and uh, the teachers have chosen the best uh, translation in the group. I see. Yeah. yeah. So, and these yeah, were so that one's my chance. Yeah. Well, I wanted to say also, um, I really enjoyed hearing the readings in English of the poems. Um, I always, I remember intellectually that many people in Russia speak with a British accent. Nevertheless, whenever I get to be at one of these Zoom meetings or when I'm with people in Russia, I just love hearing that British accent for those poems. And then the Russian uh, translations were just so wonderful for me to hear because I don't get to hear that much Russian spoken by native speakers here. I work, um, I, I practice my Russian with other Americans. Um, and I've been watching uh, a TV series. I don't know if you know it. it, it's an old one, but I've been getting the DVDs from the library. It's called The Americans. I don't know if you ever heard about it, but it's about a, a couple during, during the Cold War, during so Soviet times, who lived in uh, near Washington DC in the US and were from Russia and they were spies. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a lot of Russian on that TV series, uh, but a lot of it is, I don't even think it's Russian. <laughs> and then some of it is Russian, but it's with other accents. And now and then I pick up on an actual, what seems to be a real Russian accent. And so today it was such a relief and such a pleasure to hear uh, your native Russian speak speakers doing the translations. <clears throat> okay, so you practiced your Russian a little bit. <laughs> Quite a bit. Yeah, I'm trying to get better slowly. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. So, other comments? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to echo um, it, what, what everyone said. And it, it was um, re really wonderful to hear hear all of your work. I was very impressed um, by everything the, the readings in English and the, and the translations. I don't, I don't, I don't, of course, I don't, I don't speak Russian. Fortunately, I don't know Russian, but, but it was still. Um, yeah, a real treat to, to hear to hear it spoken um, in Russian. It was really uh, uh, it was really wonderful to hear. Um, I think even especially with poetry, I actually heard a poet um, tell me this once. Uh, when, when you're listening to poetry, even if it's in a spoken in a language that you don't understand, you can still you know feel it. You can still maybe understand the and feel the emotion. And I, I always liked um, like what he said, and so. So it was really wonderful to hear it. And, and, and I also love the stories and all the, the presentations. I feel like you guys could put together like a collection of, of children's stories for Christmas. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're very impressive. Um, I, I enjoyed listening to them. So, so thank you all for, for sharing. 
Okay, thank you, Monique. Yeah, so the poems, actually, you can just uh, listen to the poems in any language because they're musical, yeah, and you can enjoy the sound. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right. Maybe. Could I add one more thing, Tatiana, about the um, stories also uh, and the presentations? I know how long it, it takes a long time to write a story. Uh, and then to also put a presentation with it is a huge time commitment. I think you all did a really wonderful job of, of both of those. And I always love hearing how, how people, how every person makes a story in their own special way. And all three of those stories, even though they were all about, you know, figures that we know of from, Chris, from Christmas our whole lives, uh, they were all creative, different stories, and that just shows, you know, the individuality of each writer and creator. So, thank you for sharing those. I really enjoyed that. You're welcome. Yeah, they had all some individual touch. Yeah. Okay. Yes. More maybe comments or questions to our speakers. Maybe some questions popped into your minds while you were listening and doing. The recitals. So you have three poets, yeah? Three renowned poets, actually, from America with you. So you can ask questions to them. And I don't think the questions should be necessarily about uh, poetry. Yeah, you can ask about anything. Like we've got three speakers from different parts of America. Uh, so uh, very, very, very different parts of America. Yeah, Alaska, California, and Texas. And Manik also can tell you a little bit about Long Island, <laughs> New York. Tatiana, may I say a few words? Uh, yes, sure. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, dear Carol. Hello, Monique. I think all the three renowned poets, uh, poet, uh, poets, uh, not only represent the American culture, but uh, different uh, cultures uh, inside themselves. That is multi-culturedness uh, a priori. Am I right? Because uh, Carolyn, you represent uh, the uh, the other culture, the uh, ancient cultures of the uh, uh, of the north of the, of America. And Monique, I think uh, I have heard in your poems uh, mostly Jewish culture, and you have been bearing uh, a lot of uh, misery of the Jewish uh, people nowadays. Am I right? And uh, Carol, I think uh, uh, you've shared uh, a sort of a liveliness of the uh, of the south, or, or not south, but of uh, uh, your place, that is California. It's not. Uh, uh, it's not uh, the common culture. It's uh, the diverse culture. And the students, you, you've been very happy to come close. To, to um, unique cultures within America, to different unique cultures within America. And Tatiana, uh, you've been very, very, uh, you've been a, a good uh, bridge today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It was my pleasure. Right. Yeah, so the, the USA is actually all about multiculturalism, as we call it, yeah, and there are many, many cultures, and we've seen, like, different uh, American culture from different angles, yeah, indigenous people, the culture of immigrants, um, and the Jewish culture, of course, uh, which is a great part of the US. Um, okay, so if no more questions, no more comments, are you sure? Uh, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Sasha. Uh, mm, I am interested in how you uh, 
uh, celebrate Christmas uh, in Alaska, for example? Are there any special um, traditions in your family? Mm -hmm. That's the question to Carolyn, I guess, right? Uh -huh. Could you say the first part again? I didn't catch uh, the first uh, I'm interested uh, in how you celebrate Christmas. Ah. Um, well, first I'll say, since Paulina mentioned indigenous people of Alaska, um, the, the, the various Alaska native cultures up here, uh, of course, they had their own traditions until outsiders came. And then Alaska was divided up among different missionaries. And so most, uh, I would say most Alaska natives now belong <laughs> to a Christian religion. And the um, the villages all over Alaska, they're very, re many of them are rural and remote, like Boryatia. Um, uh, they were only exposed to one religion because missionaries were assigned to a certain part of Alaska and that part was only missionized by that religion. So for instance, when I lived in Tanunik, when I first came to Alaska about 36 years ago and taught in a school there, that village was missionized by the Jesuit Catholics. So everyone there was Jesuit. Um, and I learned a lot about that because I didn't grow up as a Catholic. I grew up as a Protestant, as a Presbyterian. Um, and then later I became interested in world relig religions and learning about all the religions around the world. Um, so when I lived in Tanunik, I got to learn about Catholicism more than I had before. So I just wanted to say, and partly in answer to your question, um, Alaska Native people have their own traditions and they mix them with Christian traditions at Christmas. I would say that. Um, but many people here also come from, you know, for instance, I am not Alaska Native. Um, although I've written a lot about their issues and their history. And I'm very interested in indigenous people all over the world. Um, but I personally am a, a background of German and British and a little bit of Irish. So my, my ancestors came over from Europe to the United States. And uh, so my background is in some ways Western, but in others, it's pretty multicultural, as Paulina mentioned. And I think that's the case for many people in Alaska um, because people who are not Alaska native have come here from all over the world and all over the United States. It's kind of like Siberia and the Far East and the Russian Far East. Many indigenous people lived there and then others came from Western Russia and other parts of the world. Well, Alaska is like that also. And so we have a mix of traditions. And I would just say, as for me personally, as you probably picked up on, I'm, I'm interested in spirituality, as I said, and it can be a mix of things for me, a mix of things I grew up with as a Christian and a mix of things with Buddhism and even shamanism, connections with the natural world. Uh, and so like a lot of people here, I, I especially like the winter solstice, which is December 21st. It's a very favorite tradition in Alaska for people to celebrate it because it's the shortest day of the year. That will be on Tuesday for us. Uh, and on that day, then after that, we get a little more daylight every day. Uh, and that's, it's such a miracle how that happens, you know, that our planet goes around the sun and every year the sun goes away, but it comes back. And I hope that keeps happening. Um, so, so we often celebrate the solstice. We have fireworks this Saturday night downtown in celebration of the solstice. And it's a way that many people can celebrate together, uh, not just the Christian Christmas, but the idea of of nature and of the importance of the planet and, and all the things that feed the planet and, and take care of the planet. It's really interesting, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. So we have many holidays merged together, yeah? During, during December, actually. Okay, yes. Any more questions? 
actually. I have uh, one quick, quick, quick question. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, what was the longest and the shortest time to write uh, your works? Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> All right. I, I guess I, I can start. It, it, that is a great question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, a little tough to answer. Um, I, I guess everyone is a little different for, for me. I mean, some of my poems I've been working on and off for many years. Um, it's, it's not, not like I'm working on them every week for five years, but, but I'll, I'll work on them for a little bit and then I'll, I'll leave it for a while and I'll come back and I'll leave it and I'll come back and on and off and on and off. And, um, and, and so, so some, I, I actually have, I mean, I, I finished grad school, um, in 2015, which is when I wrote a lot of, uh, my poems I've, I've been working on when, when, when I was in grad school graduate school for poetry in Oklahoma um, and and some of those poems I'm, I'm still working on since, since then um, you know and I've written some since then but but it, it, it can be quite a long process on the other hand of course you, you can write a poem and, and be done with it in a week or you know a day or you know and, and a lot of um, poets have, have had success with that I think um, that there's a, a famous poet in America um, called Frank O'Hara, he, he's not alive anymore, um, but, but he was active during um, the, the 1900s. And he has, a, he has a famous collection called Lunch Poems. And um, from what I understand, most of those poems he just wrote in his lunch break. And, and I don't think, it, from what I know, I don't think he really did much if any editing or anything like that. And, and, and I mean, he was very successful. So yeah, I mean, everyone can have different experiences with that. Um, but, but sometimes I find it can be good unless you're like a Frank O'Hara, which I, I'm not, <laughs> um, you know, it, it can be good once you write down to take some time away. Once you, once you write your work, it re really not only with poetry, but, you know, stories, really anything to, to take some time away, whether it's like a few days or a few weeks or a few months and come back to it. And, and, and then it's really like, you're looking at it, like you're another person because you get some distance and you're able to look more critically and see, okay, here's how I could change it. And here's how I can make it better. Um, so, so I find it's beneficial to take time you know, on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Yes, Carol, how about you? I just I would like to change uh, the focus for a minute and, and talk about the experience of listening to a poem. <clears throat> and I always think that if you take one thing away from a poem, whether you're listening to it or reading it, then it's a successful experience. It could be one image, it could be a phrase, it could be the use of language, inventive language, but if something lingers in your mind, then that's a successful experience because it's, it's a lot to absorb even in one's own native language because poems are so packed with things. So I think the experience of a poem, if something stays with you, then it's been a successful experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carol, thank you for your comment. Yes, Carolyn, would you like to talk about how yeah. long you do? Uh -huh. I think I might follow up on what Carol just said. Um, that is so true. And she mentioned reading poems out loud. And I'll just say one reason I love um, preparing a presentation or a reading of my work, such as I did for tonight, well, right now it's nighttime here, um, is because I end up looking over lots of pieces, trying to decide what, what do I want to read for this particular audience. And then I end up editing many more things than I'm actually going to use because I, because I have those fresh eyes that Monique mentioned. And so I haven't looked at some of those pieces for a long time. And I see, oh, that isn't quite right. I need to tweak that a little, change that word or add a detail or take something out and so on. And um, so for me, it's actually an ongoing process. And even when a piece is finished and published, like the piece I read tonight, Secret Santa, which was published in 2017 in a literary journal in Yukon, Canada. Um, but I wanted to read that poem for you guys tonight 
because I wanted to read at least one thing that was related directly to Christmas. And so I took that out and I changed one thing. Uh, at the very end, I saw there was one detail that wasn't there and I needed to put it in there. So I actually changed that a little, even though it's already been published. Um, and that certainly has happened with other pieces of mine, nonfiction also, where I, if I go back to it, I often change things. Um, but to answer the question about what was the fastest thing, for me, some of my poems have come really fast, uh, a, a rough draft, and then they've stayed not exactly like that, but quite similar to the original. And I've noticed that those were usually things that I had thought about and felt for years. And they had been, one writer in, a, in up here calls it composting. They had been uh, developing in my subconscious and my soul and my heart, not just my brain for a very long time. And so when I sat down to actually write about that topic or write about that feeling, a whole poem came out quickly. That doesn't happen for me usually about recent, for recent things. It happens more for things that happened a while back. So I'm hoping that will be the case with my Boryatia book because I started working on the idea in 2008 and that's already 13 years ago. That's a really long time ago. And it's also possible to forget, to forget details and feelings and experiences and that's where journaling is very helpful. And I think many writers keep a journal in various ways of their every day or every week or even you know, irregularly their thoughts and feelings and experiences because then they can look back at that later as a resource. Mm -hmm. Okay, so writing a poem is an ongoing process, yeah? And it can go on throughout your life actually. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the tips and Thank you for the answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So maybe one more question, and then we're going to close up. A question or a comment, maybe. Um. um do, uh, I have a question to Caroline and Carol and Monique. Uh, do you have any favorite? Uh, uh, writers and if you do uh who are they could you say mm -hmm. that again you faded a bit uh, uh do you have any favorite writers and who are they mm -hmm. who are your favorite writers well, in Russian, Anna Akhmatova, I go back to her all the time. By the way, this is my literary cat. Her name is Gretel. Uh -huh. And she was crying at the door to come in. Uh, I read a lot of uh, contemporary fiction, but I read lots and lots of poetry. So I'll send Tatiana a list of some novels and poets I like. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Caroline, do you want to speak about it? I still really love Virginia Woolf. She's a British prose mm -hmm. writer uh, who I was introduced to way long ago in college. She had a huge influence on me back then. Uh, and I still go back and read her work. Um, she died after World War I. Um, so she's been gone from the earth for a long time, but her novels uh, and essays are, they just are rich for me forever. And um, speaking of Russian poets, I got interested in Marina Tsvetaeva after coming back from Russia the first time and read some of her work in translation in English, but I can tell it's nothing like it is in Russian. Um, so I've tried to read some of it in Russian haltingly, um, but her life is very interesting to me and her work and her experimentation. Uh, mm -hmm. And then currently there's a writer in Idaho, Anthony Doerr, 
who is a um, fiction writer. I had the, the privilege of meeting him up here in Alaska a few summers ago when he came as a guest writer. Um, he wrote a best-selling novel that some of you might know about, but it's rather long, so I, I, you probably haven't read it. Um, but someday, maybe you will. Um, it's called All the Things We Cannot See. Uh, it's related to World War II and revolves around two young people who are, who are the main characters. One is German and the other is French. Um, it's a, he's an incredible storyteller. Tatiana was mentioning the idea of storytelling and the power of it. He is, I think, one of our finest contemporary storytellers. And he just came out with a book this year that is also a right away a bestseller. And it was a finalist for um, the National Book Award. And it's called Cloud Cuckoo Land. It's a really unusual title, Cloud Cuckoo Land. And I haven't gotten to read it yet. Um, I tried to get it at a bookstore, but it's totally sold out throughout the country. Can't get a whole, uh, can't buy a paperback copy of it right now, but it will get back in circulation once all the ships get back over here with the paper that is needed and the books that are coming that are stuck in the supply line. So I can't get that book right now except through the library. But he is a um, just, a, an, I think he's an incredible storyteller, fiction, fiction storyteller. Okay, yes, thank you for recommendations. And Manik, do you have a favorite author? Yeah, um, it's, it's always hard to, to pick a small um, handful, but, but I, I happen to be, my desk happens to be right next to my poetry shelf, so I was just pulling some things off that I really liked. Um, so um, I, I do, Mary Jo Bang is um, an, an, a, a contemporary American poet um, and, and she, she's pretty renowned and pretty incredible. I, I love her work and I've been very inspired by it and also by um, Anne Carson, um, who, who is um, an, another really great contemporary poet. Um, and, and she's actually done some really interesting things reworking like some like ancient mythological and like Greek myth, 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 mythological stories, um, making them into like more modern stories. So um, if you're interested in that, I would definitely recommend um, checking her out. I also have a, a couple other uh, poets I like here. Um, this is a book by uh, Louise Gluck, also a, a contemporary poet. And, and this book is really fun. It's a book written from the perspective of um, flowers, like written, written from the point of view of flowers. So it's, 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 it's really well done. It's called The, the, the Wild Iris. Um, so yeah, that, that is one I like. There's also, um, Really big fan of, of Rita Dove, who's also a contemporary American poet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and she's, she's been very successful and very um, renowned in, in the US and the world. So um, she, she has some pretty incredible writing. Um, and, and then the last one that I pulled out um, is, is kind of a crazy one, a crazy book. Um, it's, it's a book by Frank Stanford. He's, he's not contemporary, um, he uh, passed away, but uh, he was he was active in, in the um, in the 1900s around the 70s and, and the 60s and he, he's from Arkansas, the U.S. state of Arkansas, which is just um, to the east of Texas. And he wrote this book called uh, "The Battlefield Where the Moon Says I Love You," and it's 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 this long. It's this long. <laughs> It's, it's, it's this crazy book I'll, I'll say right now I haven't read the whole thing. <laughs> I think I've gotten to like about half of it. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's just like it's all just um, like this. It's all just like one. It's all the whole thing is just one poem. There are no like line. I mean, there, there are no there's no separation. It's not a series of poems. It's just it's uh, almost 400 pages. Um, it's, it's just one long poem, um, and, and so of course it, it can be up for anyone hard to read. But just you know, I, it, it, it's been a real experience just reading it and, and coming back to it and, and seeing how, um, how how he's able to weave and you know make it interesting. And uh, anyway, yeah. So those are a few poets that I've been um, inspired by. Thanks. So it's uh, really interesting to hear about contemporary poets here yeah, and contemporary works. So what should we read? And uh, well, if you if you care, can you send me 
uh, your recommendations later <clears throat> by email, yeah? And I will put it in our folder. Absolutely. Oh, it's um, fiction writers. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So I think we uh, close, we'll close off here. So uh, I would like to thank our speakers for coming um, today. Let's thank our speakers. Yes. And let's thank our student speakers who took uh, the courage and wrote and um, talked about the poetry and uh, told their stories. So they were all very interesting. And I heard um, that all the three American speakers talked about their family history a lot, yeah? And uh, all the coming holidays are connected with family. Yeah, we all get together with family or friends. Yeah, and um, we spend this time with our families. And um, so I wish you all Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah, though it's over already, but still, yeah. Uh, so, and um, it was a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you very much for, for being with us today. And thank you to all the students who could make it. Um, and um, they are going to have to go to a class now. So that's why we are saying goodbye. And thank you, Tatiana, for organizing. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Shall we uh, uh, stay one five minutes or some? Yes. I mean uh, the uh, the American great ladies. Yep. Yeah. Alina wants to say some highs and thanks to our American speakers. Yeah. So, but all the students can go, that's fine. Yeah, if you need to go to the class, yes, you can go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Bye. Thank you, okay, goodbye. Thank goodbye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful to see you, Paulina. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see you again <laughs> and uh, get acquainted with Monique. Hi, Monique. Carolyn, <clears throat> yes. I'm hugging and kissing you. Yes, <laughs> li likewise. I was so happy to see your face and, and your name on the Zoom. <laughs> Me too. I was uh, sorry, uh, I joined in quite late. Uh, I ha I've had I did uh, have to do some things. I'm sure you're very busy as always. <laughs> uh, Caroline, did you write your uh, <clears throat> story about staying in Buryatia? Did you well, publish yeah. it? Uh, no, when it's finished, you you guys will be the first to know. Um, oh, oh, I it's, see. It, it's not finished. It's a It's a book. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'm still working on it. I have experimented in a lot of ways um, uh -huh. with essays, poems, uh -huh. uh, nonfiction, and a lot of structures for it also. And uh, I think I've got, I think I finally found the right way to work uh -huh. with it. Oh, I'm see. really excited. But my goal is to have the draft finished by the end of 2022. Ah, 22, okay. Yeah. And uh, you were planning to uh, also to apply for another visit. It's not I do a success. Really want, I really want to come back, yeah. And uh, so I'm planning to apply, depending on how COVID is looking, if it looks like- Yeah we won't be able to come back for another year then i would wait it probably to apply to you know until year after mm -hmm. um but i am planning to i really want to come back 
and I would love to bring the book. Yeah, we will be helping very much. And so Carol, we'll are you writing something about our, uh, about Buryatia? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, the core of a new manuscript are poems oh. that came out of Ulanude. So I see. So mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah. And uh, Monique, uh, uh, do, have you got any plan for a visit? I mean, to Buryatia? I would love to visit. I've never been to Russia. It, it came close. Oh. We were in a <sighs> family trip, but we weren't able to get the visa in, in time, unfortunately. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I would really love to come visit. Um, hopefully, once COVID, if you know. Yeah. Down COVID is something, uh, a sort of prison, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Makes it a is. prison. It is. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, the reason I'm speaking about your uh, reminiscences or something uh, is that uh, it will be uh, a good uh, a good resource. Uh, I mean, your uh, your expectations may maybe you hadn't met your expectations you met uh, about uh, cross cultures your while being in Buryatia. And it will be a good chance for our students to, uh, to make an investigation of your subconscious, subconscious in your brain. <laughs> because um, uh, our theory of translation is something about on psycholinguistics. That is, uh, we, uh, we try to correlate different, uh, uh, different modes of uh, thinking, mind sharing uh, world view uh, world view and uh, something like that and we will uh, we are constantly searching for resources uh, which explicate uh, multi multi cultured minds mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so Monique, if you come here, you will get an enormous source of inspiration, I think. Like Carolyn and Carol, they haven't been to Russia for many years now, but still they write poems about Russia, you know? Always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, what about uh, pandemic times? Uh, did you uh, overcome everything? I mean, uh, coronavirus diseases in your families, in your friends. As for me, I, uh, I did have a, coronavir a coronavirus in uh, October, mm -hmm. but it was uh, an, easy, uh, an easy endurance. I'm glad that you're okay. I, I'm okay, yes. Uh, wow. I was vaccinated, of course, mm -hmm. before, and I don't uh, understand anti-vaxxers. Don't start <laughs> me on that. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, Paulina, in Alaska, uh, only about half of the population has gotten vaccinated. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see what happens with Omicron. Mm, yeah. You know, because the first case was found in Anchorage last, I think this week or la late last week, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably here. And we had uh, our worst time with COVID in, in just recently in October and November was very bad. The ho hospitals were so full, they had to turn people away. Mm, I see. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens. I think we're curious, but I noticed that more people at the post office yesterday were wearing a mask mm -hmm. because many people just don't want to get vaccinated and don't want to wear a mask. And mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. It's uh, the other side of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Los Angeles has a mask mandate, and now to go into a restaurant, if you want to eat indoors, you have to show your vaccination. Mm -hmm. So they have upped the um, 
But uh, I need to leave in a minute. My husband is waiting for supper. Uh, uh, yeah, and my yeah, cat yeah, is yeah, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but we okay. have strong uh, and pretty good vaccination in Los Angeles. But you know, people from all over come here. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Right. So I think we should say goodbye. I have uh, some uh, things to do. Yes. Um, okay. So thank you very much again for seeing us. Yes. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Maybe, uh, wonderful to see mm -hmm. you. We'll yes. meet uh, one more time, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. uh, this, this academic year. Tanya will organize it, I think. Okay, next that year. Would be wonderful. Mister. Okay. And and Paulina, I'm going to be sending you an email in the coming okay. week. I meant to uh, when I heard from Aliona uh, ah. a month ago, probably now. But I, I, you're on my list, and I will be emailing you very soon. I was really. <laughs> I'll be hoping. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. See you and hear Thank you. Much. Have a happy holiday. Bye. Happy holidays. Stay safe. Yeah. Stay safe. Yeah. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.